In the previous section, we saw how the math works in multiple degrees of freedom and how we can generalize our discussion for the thermodynamics. Now we need to see how it generalizes for uh, measurements, information theory, and for state mapping. So let's start with uh, determinism and reversibility in terms of measurement. If you recollect, we said that a deterministic and reversible process is one that given, the, uh, in, given a measurement, we can reconstruct either the initial or the finder of measurement at least at the same level of uncertainty. The question now is how does this uncertainty behave in terms of the independent degrees of freedom? So if the independent degrees of freedom are truly independent, we would expect that if we increase the or decrease the uncertainty for one degree of freedom, we would not affect the uncertainty of the other independent degrees of freedom. So for example, this line here represents the xpx plane, and uh, this line here represents the ypy plane. And so this represents our uncertainty in uh, in the YPY plane, and this represents the uncertainty on our XPX. And if we were to increase the uncertainty on, on the YPY plane, we would expect that the projection on the XPX plane remains the same, so that the uncertainty represented on these planes remains the same. This can only happen if the YPY plane is orthogonal to the xpx plane. If it wasn't orthogonal, then of course the projection would increase on the xpx plane and then the degrees of freedom wouldn't be really independent. So in terms of measurements, for uh, uh, different degrees of freedom to be truly independent, they have to be orthogonal in phase space. Now we have to understand how this behaves during our transformation, during our deterministic and reversible process the YPY plane will be mapped point by point onto its image, which is going, what we are going to call Y prime and P prime Y. The same thing is going to happen with the XPX uh, plane. It's going to have an image and we're going to call it X prime and P prime X. If Y prime and P where prime is truly the image of Y P Y, then we expect that given a point in Y P Y prime, we're going to get a point in Y prime P Y prime. But again, we're going to expect to make this connection at the same level of uncertainty. So that given this initial condition on the Y P Y prime uh, of the Y P Y plane, we're going to be able to give a similar condition on the Y P, Y, prime, plane. And the same we're going to expect between X, P, X and X prime, P, X. So we're, expect, we're going to expect that the uncertainty on the Y plane is going to be the same uncertainty on the Y prime plane and the uncertainty on X is going to be uh, the same uncertainty on the X prime planes. Which means, uh, if you remember that the area on the Y, P, Y prime is going to be equal to the area on the y, p, y prime plane and the area on the x plane is going to be the same as the area on the x prime plane. Well, we are also going to expect that if we started with these two degrees of freedom, uh, of freedom being independent, uh, we're going to expect to end up to two degrees of freedom that are equally independent. So we start with x and y independent, x prime and y prime have to remain independent, which means that these have to be re have to remain orthogonal. So, from this discussion, we understand that the image, the uncertainty on the image of each degree of freedom must be conserved, which means that the area on each degree of freedom must be conserved. And also that the degree of freedom need to remain independent, which means that they have to remain orthogonal. So these are now the two conditions that we understand in terms of the geometry that needs to be respected. Now let's look at determinants of reversibility in terms of information theory. If we remember the idea is that we had an initial distribution and a final distribution, and if given an, uh, enough information to identify an element in the initial distribution, the same amount of information should allow us to find an element in the final distribution. This information is called information entropy, and if we conserve this, we know that the area uh, must be conserved. So how does this work in multiple degrees of freedom? 
So the first thing that we expect is that if our overall distribution factorizes into the product of a distribution on X and a distribution of Y, which means that these two distributions are independent from each other, then the information, the total information to identify an element has to be the sum of the information on the X plus the information on the Y. If there were some correlation on, uh, between x and y, we wouldn't be able to factor, and then we wouldn't expect this relationship. We can take the total entropy, and we substitute uh, the distribution with rho x and rho y, uh, we transform the logarithm of the product in the product of the logarithm, and we have this expression here. If we start in that, instead with the sum of x and y, we get these two expressions in terms of x and y, we can multiply the first expression by 1, which is the integral of the whole distribution of y, and we can multiply the second distribution by 1, which is the whole integral in x, and now we basically have to have that this equation has to be equal to this expression. And this can only be true if you're able to take the integral out and make it, uh, make it one integral, and we can do that if x and y are orthogonal. So again, if we want uh, these uh, uh, degrees of freedom to be independent, we want to satisfy this relationship, and this tells us that uh, the uh, degree of freedom in phase space must, must be orthogonal. So what's going to happen during a deterministic and reversible evolution? Well, what we'll want to happen is that, uh, of course, the total amount of uh, uh, information is going to be the same, but the information of x is going to map uh, on the image, so it's going to map to the information on the x, y, degree of freedom, and the i, y, the information on the y, is going to map uh, on uh, its image, so it's going to be an i, y prime. So what we're going to want is that the i prime, the total, is going to be equal to the i, x prime plus i, y prime. So the entropy on the image of each degree of freedom must be conserved. So again, we're going to need to conserve the area of each degree of freedom, because if we want to conserve the, the entropy, we need to conserve the area. And also, uh, since we want the total sum of all uh, degrees of freedom uh, entropy to remain the same, we need that uh, the degree of freedom, they start orthogonal and they remain orthogonal. So we get the same condition that we got from our discussion in terms of measurements. Now, if we start instead from the state mapping, again, we're going to have a bijective mapping from the initial state on the final state. It's going to be a one-to-one -one mapping. How, how is this going to work in terms of multiple degrees of freedom? Well, the first thing that we want is that the total number of states must be the product between the subcases for each degree of freedom. So, if in X we have three cases, and in Y we have two cases, then the total number of cases is going to be six. Now, in the continuous limit, this means that the area on the X be explained, which is going to represent the number of cases in X, times the area on the y py plane, which is going to represent the number of subcases in the y py plane, is going to be equal to the volume, which represents all the states that we have. And of course, this can only happen if uh, the x and y plane are orthogonal, because the volume is all going to be equal the product of the areas only if they are orthogonal. Okay. So we found the same condition. Now, how does the mapping work? Well, we want, of course, to map each state to a final state, but we want to do, be able to do more than that, because if these uh, degrees of freedom are independent, we need to be able to match the subcases of y to the subcases of y prime, its image. So this case is going to correspond to this case. And also we we'll want, we'll want to match the cases in x to the cases in x prime. So this case is going to match to this case. So again, we want the number of cases on each degree of freedom to remain the same, because we want to have a one-to-one -one mapping, which means that the area on each degree of freedom must remain the same. We also want the total number of cases to remain the product of the subcases, which means that the x and y plane transformed in the x prime, y prime plane must remain orthogonal. So again, we got the same 
a condition as in the previous two cases. So to recap, within a degree of freedom, if we have a small region, this is going to be mapped to an average small region of the same area, which means that the uncertainty and the entropy and the number of cases within that degree of freedom is going to be conserved. And preserving the area means preserving the vector product, because the vector product between two vectors is going to give us the area that those two vectors form. So we call vi the component of a vector v on the degree of freedom i, and wi the component of a vector uh, w on the um, degree of freedom y. We want this to be conserved. So when we uh, transport our vectors, this product has to be conserved. And this product between these two components is given us by this matrix. Now, instead, across degree of freedom, what we're going to want is that the image can change the area, but the direction must remain orthogonal, which means that the uh, independent degree of freedom remain independent. If this is true, the scalar product between uh, the component of vectors along different uh, degrees of freedom must be zero and must be, remain zero during uh, our deterministic and reversible process. And this condition is given us by this matrix. So now if we combine with the matrix with the previous matrix, we get this. The cross terms are all zero Right? This represents the relationship between uh, different uh, uh, degrees of freedom, while uh, within the same degree of freedom we have the vector product. And we recognize this matrix as being the omega alpha beta that we defined before. So now we have a reason, we have an understanding of where this matrix comes from. It's, just, it's not just a mathematical trick that we used to make our notation uh, simpler. It it's actually has meaning. The meaning is that omega alpha beta gives us the metric that is preserved by the deterministic and reversible motion. If we have two vectors and we multiply by uh, omega alpha beta, we get this expression, which basically sums uh, the vector product within uh, all the independent degrees of freedom, which represents the area the sum of the areas in all the degrees of freedom, which basically gives us a measure of the number of states. If these two directions, for example, represent x and px, we're going to be given one, which is going to tell us that the area represented by x and px represents one unit of states. While if we put x and y, for example, then this is going to tell us zero, because x and y do not create, do not represent a degree of freedom. doesn't get mapped deterministically and reversibly. Okay, so what we're basically saying that a deterministic and reversible motion should conserve this, should conserve our measure for the number of states. If we impose the conservation of this metric during the evolution, we expect to find Hamilton's equation. So let's see if we can actually do that. So what we're going to have is that the metric uh, in terms of the original vectors is going to give us the same value as in terms of the transform vector. So the first thing that we have to do is express the final vectors in terms of the original vectors. And if the transformation is infinitesimal, we can use our S alpha to calculate what the difference is. So our V prime alpha is going to be equal to the original vector alpha plus all the components transformed by the derivative of s in that direction. This gives the, the infinitesimal change that the transformation is going to give us. So now, if we multiply this and this, it gives us the original term, and we put it here. These terms multiply with these terms, it gives us uh, orders of dt squared, so we're going to ignore it. So what we're interested in is this terms times this term and this term times this term, which are, we're going to have here. So the first thing that we're going to do is to use our omega alpha beta to take the upper component and transform it in the down component. So this S alpha becomes the S lower beta. 
The same is going to happen here, but first we have to switch the order of alpha and beta because this has to match the first index. Now, if we switch the order of alpha and beta, we get a minus sign because the omega is not symmetric, but it's anti-symmetric. So, okay, so we get minus s lower alpha. Another thing that we can do is that since this gamma is summed over, it doesn't really matter how we call it. So we can replace gamma with alpha. Same thing here, we're going to replace the delta, since it's summed over, with beta. Now we can collect the v alpha w beta outside, and we get this. And we recognize this as being the curl of s lower alpha, and so what we're basically saying here is that to preserve the metric, we need the curl of the s lower alpha to be zero, which is the same condition that we had before in the thermodynamic case. So if the curl of s lower alpha is equal to zero, we can define a potential so that s lower alpha is equal to the gradient of h, and then combining these two equations and our definition of uh, upper alpha and lower alpha, we get again the Hamilton equation. So now we have the full picture of Hamiltonian mechanics for multiple degrees of freedom. The math states that the state at the time t plus dt is a function of the state of time t, and each degree of freedom preserves the area, and then the independent degree of freedom remain perpendicular. Now what happens to the flux in the sixth dimension of phase space, it's very difficult to visualize. I cannot do that. Then we know that in terms of measurement, past and future are predicted at the same level of uncertainty, and each independent degree of freedom preserves the uncertainty independently. In the thermodynamic case, we saw that the system is isolated and reversible, and each degree of freedom gives uh, independent contributions to the energy. In terms of the information theory, we saw that the information entropy is preserved, and it's preserved for each degree of freedom. In terms of the state mapping, we have a bijective map, but each degree of freedom has its own independent map. And so we truly see that Hamiltonian mechanics is completely equivalent to assuming deterministic and reversibility with independent degrees of freedom.